Danny, welcome back to Wharton. Great to be here. Well, that remains to be seen, doesn't it? <laughs> he's, I would, he's, he wants to give you guys something to get real excited about before long, so he's going to throw them up and in. I can't wait. That's going to happen, whether you like it or not. Uh, but let's, let's just get a sense of the room. How many of you have uh, dined at a Union Square restaurant? A lot. OK, how many have read Setting the Table? OK, those of you who haven't, please leave, read it, and then come back. No. Uh, and then uh, any Shake Shack fans? OK. So we have a sense of your audience. Um, Danny, I think that what a lot of people don't realize is you've not just been a pioneer in the way that you've made food. You've also transformed the way that a lot of people think about frontline work culture. And that's a big part of what we, what we want to talk about today. So can you start just by telling us a little bit about your, your founding philosophy of how did you decide what you wanted your values to be as a, as a restaurateur? I think my founding philosophy was born out of my own insecurity. Um, I was 27 when I opened Union Square Cafe, and I had only been anyone's boss before that once in my life. I'd been a salesman. Um, I liked hearing earlier, I was also one of these people that was supposed to be a lawyer, took my LSAT, never applied to law school after that. But the only other time I had ever been anyone's boss before that was working on a political campaign, uh, a guy named John Anderson, who ran as the independent presidential um, candidate in 1980 against Reagan and uh, Carter. Obviously, he lost, as all independent candidates do. Um, but he did get about 7% of the vote. The reason I'm bringing this up, Adam, is that as I had about 25 people reporting to me, and they were all volunteers. So I didn't have the opportunity to give anyone a raise, couldn't dock anyone their pay, couldn't give anyone a bonus. 100% of how I had to motivate people was with the higher purpose of why we were all doing this. Really foundational experience. I then opened Union Square Cafe at the age of 27. Half the people working for me were older than I was. And so when I talk about insecurity, I, I had this awful affliction that I think a lot of first-time leaders have, which is it was far more important for me to be liked than to command respect from people. And without knowing it, I was unintentionally but intuitively adopting servant leadership. And I went to work every day for the purpose of making those guys feel successful and adopt and also <coughs> appropriating what I had learned from the political campaign, which was, and give them a reason over and beyond their job to want to come to work. I love that. What, what was the reason? How did you explain the purpose early on? The purpose was that we wanted to make people leave happier than however they felt when they came. And, and that started with you guys, people working for it. I know you guys are going to work really hard, okay? I hope you make a lot of money. But more than anything, your job is going to be to do so many thoughtful things for each other that by the end of the day, you're going to go, that was like playing tennis with some really good friends. I'm tired, but I feel better for some reason. And that, over time, I think um, we got a lot more intentional about stuff that had been just intuitive from the outset. I think one of the, the interesting things about your early days is culture building is easier for you now because you have a brand. People know, they come to Union Square or Shake Shack with a set of expectations about what you stand for. Back then, nobody knew who you were. Nobody knew what you were about. How did you explain the culture you wanted to build to people? Well, the fact is I didn't. I, I went to work every single day. For the first 10 years of my career, I had exactly one restaurant, Union Square Cafe. And my leadership philosophy was pretty weak. It was, if you see me doing it, that's what I expect you to do. And I had, you know, I had so many, so many important things I had to learn. If I wanted you to do something, I had the awful habit in those early days of saying, can I ask you a favor? <laughs> Excuse me, it's your job. What? Wait, what who are you, the godfather? <laughs> Far from it. Yeah, I would grab people by the cheeks and say, you see that napkin on the floor? I know you can pick it up, and so do you. Um, so. That's a good Godfather impression. I did not know. How would, how, we've known each other for a decade. I had no idea you had that in you. Wait till you see how good I am with olive pits in my mouth. Yeah, I can really do it well. But any, anyway, uh, what happened was when I finally opened a second restaurant, Gramercy Tavern, and I was literally like a Three Stooges routine, the one where you push in one drawer and the other one comes out and you push in that drawer. Whatever I got 
fixed at Union Square Cafe, it would be messed up at Gramercy Tavern. And I, I was a whirling dervish. I didn't know how to speak. You talk about a four-day work week. I didn't have enough days in the week. I would spend either all lunches at one restaurant fixing things and then all dinners at the other. Or I'd spend Monday through half of Wednesday at one and the other half of Wednesday through Friday at the other. And it finally dawned on me that the thing that we used to tell our kids when they were babies, use your words, is also a really effective thing in business and leadership. <laughs> Until I started to use my words and say, this is what I expect you to do. And I started taking a page out of our chef's playbook. Guess what a recipe is? It's using your words. If you follow these steps and do these things, you will get that result. I was never doing any of that stuff until I had two restaurants. And you're right. Over time, I learned that when you do use your words, and you use them from the very get-go, when you're hiring someone, you tell people, this is what success will look like. When you do this kind of stuff, we're going to be really happy. When you don't do this stuff, we're not going to be really happy. But using our words and making things really crystal clear has been the journey. And I'd say, I'm skipping ahead one thing if I can. In, only in this last two years have we, I think, gotten it even better, which is moving from something we were really proud of for years, having family values. That, those are our words, right? It started off with, we have a coffee mug in my office, by the way, where we made, before Wordle was a game, there was something called a Wordle where we went to the entire company, every frontline worker, and said, what are the most five what are the five most uh, frequent words that come to your mind when you think about what it's like to work around here? And I have this mug still on my desk that has probably 95 words on it, as if we could expect anyone in our company to hold themselves responsible for memorizing 95 words. Family, generosity, inclusiveness, you know, happiness, spirit, food, all the words that came to their minds. And and then we said, that's not going to work, so we're going to have a better idea. So we came up with, here are our five family values. We came up with five family values. And it was only two years ago. And by the way, those, those family values were, could have been anyone's family values. Excellence, hospitality, entrepreneurial spirit, in, um, integrity, right? That could be anyone's. And so two years ago, we finally did something way better using our words. And we said, number one, it's not a family because I had gotten in a lot of trouble because whenever we would fire someone, you don't fire your family members. And it would demoralize. You could furlough them, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I guess so. That doesn't work so well. My sister didn't like it when I tried that on her. But, um, um, so we changed family values. It's not a family. And how do you hold someone really accountable to a value? We changed that to expected behaviors. And it is a business. These are the behaviors. We now have five expected behaviors. And we do hold people accountable when we talk about those behaviors, when we hire you, when we review you. And every single meeting that we have starts with those behaviors. And people know what they are. Well, there, there's so much to unpack here. First of all, I love that you walked away from the family idea. Uh, because I think you're right, it sets unrealistic expectations. I think when people say we're, we're creating a family here, what they really mean is we're a community that we treat each other with respect, we have a sense of belonging, we try to make everyone feel welcome and included. Uh, but the family expectation is a little bit unreasonable. It is, and it's you know, one of the things, if you've ever worked in a restaurant before, um, how many people have worked in a restaurant before? Okay, it's cool. It's, at its best, it, you, know, you want it to kind of feel like a family, but the functional parts of the family, not the dysfunctional parts. In fact, a lot of people in the restaurant business say that they spend more time with their restaurant family than with their actual family. But it's a business. and It's called the restaurant business. It's not called the restaurant family. That's the godfather again. Um, and it, it was confusing to a lot of people. So yeah. thank you. I'm going to start working on community. That's good. Oh, try it at your own risk. But I think the, the next thing that jumps out at me is I, I've always loved that you had five values when you started out. Our own Drew Carton uh, showed in a study that if you had more than five values, um, people had a hard time remembering them all, to your point. But also, they didn't always agree on what they meant. Um, and so there was, a, there was an upper bound. It seemed like fewer than three was also too few to really be clear about what people stood for. Um, I think a lot of organizations have a hard time narrowing it down to five. 
um, because there's a lot that you expect of people. How did you decide what the five core values were early on? Well, we started off by um, going to our restaurants and having meetings and asking people. First of all, we, we gave people the opportunity to populate the thing that used to be 95. Then we bucketed those over the years. Um, so everything actually started with our team. And, and then it does take a lot. I can't tell you how long it takes to get every word right. Every word matters. Not just the words that are the be expected behaviors, but the way we describe them. Because to your point, Adam, if there's the light of day between what you think I meant and what I meant, how am I going to hold you accountable for that? I, I just can't. So it's, it goes through a lot of iterations. And then we, we road test it constantly. And, and they change. So for example, um, one, of the, one of the expected behaviors is we play to win with a humble swagger. OK? And if you, could, if you could know how much debate there was over those two words, humble swagger. It could be an oxymoron if it you're not be, careful. Well, it is. It is. It's like jumbo shrimp, right? It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't really, um, but I believe that, that there is a way to be confident and humble at the same time. And that's something that we had to have meetings about. So all of these things are, they're not easy. And, well, but you've got to listen. You gotta listen. I'm sorry. What were you saying? You... <laughs> what I, what I couldn't resist. But what I what I love about that is I've I've called this confident humility for years, and the modifier of of confidence isn't enough for a lot of people to to think about that as a source of strength. It still sounds like it sounds weak. Humble swagger, that's strong. That's tough. I, I get that you're ambitious and you take pride in your work that way. And I think for a lot of years people actually heard the word hospitality. That's the name of our company, Union Square Hospitality Group. Um, they took it almost the way that people used to hear a not-profit, right? If you ran a, not -pro a non-profit, there was a sense that you weren't really out to win because you were just a non-profit. Well, non-profits have to be just as much on their game of accountability to, to have measurable results for the people who are contributing money as a for-profit. And so I learned the hard way that by talking about hospitality as much as we did, which is important, it's crucial, the way you care for people, the way you make people feel, is not an excuse to not win. As a matter of fact, that's why we had to, we had to be assertive and affirmative of that winning mattered to us. Yeah. But that's just one of the five. Tell us the others. I don't know if I can remember them, Adam. Um, You're going to fail your own values test? No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm absolutely not going to do it. Um, so center the salt shaker. So I took, we, we not I, but 100% of the expected behaviors are ideas that I wrote about in setting the table. Because, as I said earlier, it doesn't do any good to say excellence. Center the salt shaker, in fact, is a way to describe excellence. But... It's based on a story that in our company, if you've read the book, you, it, is, it is a shorthanded way of talking about excellence, which is there's, there's a center for, there's a place that the salt shaker belongs, and it, that's the center. And the minute someone moves it, your job is to move it back to the center. Everyone knows that it's a long story. In fact, I went to the restaurant last night where that story first started many, many years ago. And I go back to that restaurant to center my salt shaker, but that's one of them. Um, another one is, um, is uh, actually, we, we play to win with a humble swagger is the expected behavior, but, but the definition of it um, is just as important where everybody has a seat at the table. And so that talks to the, the need to be inclusive with what we do. But you can get a lot out of each one. Um, we leave our campsite better than we found it. So we believe that you go through life and you're leaving a wake in your path. You're responsible for the wake you're leaving in your path. And it better make things better for other people, not worse for other people. Campsite is a great alternative to community, actually. Because you can expel somebody who doesn't follow the norms of a campsite. But you also want everyone to feel welcome around the campfire. I like that a lot. Did you read Lord of the Flies? 
unfortunately. <laughs> there was some expelling done there, if I remember. Fair point. Um, I also I, I want to pick up on a couple other things that just jumped out at me. One is um, you're, you're really modeling another one of Drew Carton's findings, which is most leaders, when they talk about their visions and values, are too abstract. And people don't know what it looks like to be excellent or to have integrity. And here you are giving these very vivid, concrete examples that show people, well, here's what I need to do every day um, in order to model those, those principles. I think that empirically, that's really effective. Um, and I, I think you're illustrating it beautifully. Well, it's, it's good whenever I hear that the data supports what's in my gut. I, I really love that. It's my favorite, my second favorite part about being with you. Um, second? Did you? Yeah, the best part is I get an autographed copy of your next book. So that's, that's, that's really good. Always reduces the resale value when I put your name on it. But I think <laughs> one of the things that, that's striking to me is you have anticipated so much of what we study um, as a as a community of people, analytics, scholars, and leaders. Um, I think that sometimes I sit down with you and I feel like my purpose in my job is just to give you studies and words for things you already know and have been doing for decades. What do you not know? What are the things you would love to see people in this room investigate or study? I would love to, there's, there's a ton that I don't know, so we'll start with that, but I would love to find a way, and I've asked you about this in the past, but I'd love to find a way to measure what we call hospitality quotient. I'd love to find a way, why, I don't understand why intelligence quotient is measurable, but hospitality quotient isn't. And I define hospitality quotient as the degree to which it makes someone feel better themselves when they make someone else feel even better. And like IQ, it's not a judgment, like we all know his IQ can dance circles around mine. Doesn't make him a better person than me. I don't know how he got there it. There are other things that make me a better person than you. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. I'm trying to do humble swagger. <laughs> He'll work on the humble part. Um. <laughs> I'm try I could have been a contender. All right, go on. No, but, but you know, we... we we definitely do everything we can to hire people, irrespective of what a kind of a great cook they are or how great they are at suggesting wines. We want people who have a high HQ because the motivation for their cooking should be that they made you feel better because of it, right? The more people we can hire like that, we know what the emotional skills are. Um, there's six emotional skills. So sorry I couldn't stop at five, but there's six emotional skills that are always present at a very high level with someone who's got a high HQ. Um, I don't know how to measure those things. I know how to ask questions in an interview that gets to it. Um, I know how to use my, my sense of people's body language, my sense of people. But I also can tell you that I think I have a very high HQ and I think I'm at a disadvantage because I don't have a way to measure it. I'm actually at a disadvantage when I interview a frontline worker because I shouldn't go into the interview caring how you feel <laughs> to the degree that I do. That is a disadvantage and it actually makes it more likely that I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna hire people with a high HQ because it mattered to me to make you feel better. I should be thinking about how are you gonna make the rest of our employees feel once I hire you. I should be thinking about how are you gonna make all of our our guests, our customers feel. Couple, a couple of things stand out for me about that. The first one is, I, when you first started talking about HQ, and we've, we've talked about this over the years, the way you described it today made me think of some work that Noah Eisencraft did on, uh, with Hilary Elfenbein on um, what they called affective presence, which is the question of, do you have a consistent um, set of habits around the emotions you elicit in others? So we all know some people who light others up and some people who would be seen as annoying. Um, and they, they, they work to measure that, and they found that, yes, people do, independent of the emotions that I transmit, I consistently make other people feel certain things. But what you're adding here is that I care about my affective presence, right? And I enjoy lifting you up, and I feel bad if I've cut you down. And that, I have never seen someone study that. Um, Greg Popovich talked about it. He said he wanted to bring players under the, under the, the spurs who enjoyed other people's success. I think that's, yeah, so we're talking the same language. As a matter of fact, I actually, 
I'm a sports fan, and, and one of the things you know about sports is that there's a statistics for almost everything, right? There's statistics, take baseball, I don't even understand half the statistics, but there are 100% of the statistics in baseball are only about what happened on the field. And we know from baseball that half of any player's time is spent in the dugout, right? Well, the championship teams, you can actually watch what's happening in the dugout. I don't know how to measure it, but what's happening in the dugout has everything to do with, with their HQ. Like, watch what happens when a player on this team strikes out goes back into the dugout, gets a pat on the back. You, you'll get it next time. The other team, the guy just sits glumly on the bench afterwards, and everyone kind of disassociates with him. So there's something to that. And I, if, you know, I, I guess some of the great baseball people like Billy Bean and Theo Epstein probably understand this. Um, but why can't it be measured? Maybe we can get that done someday. I, I think this room collectively... <laughs> could pull that off. Uh, I think that needs to be a project that we should report out on next year. In the meantime, let's, let's talk about some of what you've teed up. Uh, let's talk about assessing HQ and frontline workers the way you do in interviews. And then after that, let's talk about how you develop and invest in frontline workers. So I love your interview questions. I've borrowed most of them. Uh, talk to me about the wake that people leave and how you assess that. Well, the first thing is, if they come into the interview wearing a disgusting cologne, that's going to leave a really bad wake. Um, <laughs> I, actually, I, I actually have talked to people about that in the interview. Now, that, that's, I'm not necessarily just trying to be funny. We're in an industry where you're paying, even if you don't care about restaurants that much, Adam, but you're paying for how good the food tastes and how good the wine tastes. And if there's a waiter walking through the restaurant leaving this wake of cologne... Each time you take a sniff of your wine, they've ruined your meal. So I actually will talk, if I, if I smell that on someone, I will talk about that in an interview. But I, I do think that people need to understand that empathy, which is such a crucial emotional skill, which does make up a big part of having a high HQ, um, is often described as the ability and willingness to try to walk in the other person's shoes. Just imagine how might it feel to be that person. What, it, what happened in their day when they came in? And that, by the way, that goes for bosses as well as waiters and waitresses and, and maitre d's. I think it's especially crucial for bosses to care, see the whole person and to imagine what did that person's day start like? How did, what did it take to get here to work? I got to walk eight blocks because I can afford to live near the restaurant. That person, who knows what was on the subway? Who knows what, what happened, et cetera? Who knows what happened in their household? that morning. Who knows what it was like getting their kids off to school. So we often think about empathy as the ability and willingness to walk in someone else's shoes, but what we don't often think about is the wake, which is, um, oh, and by the way, in addition to caring how that person may feel, I better also have the self-awareness to care about how I am making that other person feel, and what am I leaving in, in my wake. And we've all been in lakes before where you know, maybe not all of us, but if you've ever been in a canoe or a kayak and the motorboat, there, there's the motorboat that sees you and cares, and there's a motorboat that sees you and actually hopes to do you damage, <laughs> hopes to see how fun it'll be to see you rocking. And there are people just like that as well. There are the, and then there are those who are just unaware. So that matters a lot. I think my Taking responsibility for your own wake. Well, to that point, I think my favorite interview question that you've introduced me to is your question about the biggest misperception that other people have of you. Uh, talk to me about what you're looking for when you ask that question. I'm looking for self-awareness. So <clears throat> that is one of my favorites as well, which is what is the greatest misperception other people have about you? And you cannot answer that question unless you're willing to share the real you. So you, the only way to answer that question is to say, well, I'm really this, but the dankest thing is that people actually see me as that. And so what's incredible about that question for me is you get, you, it, it, I look at great interview questions actually lead to the next interview question, which is what, you, which is what you're doing right now. Um, but it gives me a chance to actually 
see the person and see how they see themselves. The other one that I love, and maybe we've talked about this one, is um, tell me about something that happened in your life before the age of 12 that you think has had more of an impact on you today than anything else. And it makes someone stop and think. And it shows how vulnerable they want to be or not. And it doesn't have to be they lost their pet dog or their grandmother died. Sometimes it's, you know, I, I got caught stealing a candy bar in, in the 5 and 10, if they even know what that is, in the drugstore, <laughs> in the CVS. How's that? Um, Wawa here, yeah. But, yeah, Wawa. But, but the point is, is that whatever that story is, you then get a chance to talk about, so what was the, so how, how did it change who you are today? And you're looking for vulnerability there? I'm looking for honesty, vulnerability, uh, willingness to grow, looking maybe for a little growth mindset, as we spoke about earlier today. But it's, it's another really, really good question. And it leads, what, what's great about it is that as the interviewer, it also gives me a chance to show my vulnerability. And I think that I'm, I'm not going to go there if, if I already know from the get-go that this is not someone that we're going to hire. But if, if I start to feel like it is, we start to build trust. And I think that trust is the foundation of what a great boss and subordinate relationship is going to be ultimately anyway. Well, this is one of the many reasons I've been such a fan of your leadership is right from the get-go, you're looking for hidden potential in candidates that other people might miss. Once you hire somebody, you've also, I think, gone way above and beyond to make it clear that you care about them as human beings, that you want to see them succeed, that you're there to help them grow. Talk about how you do that. What happens in onboarding? What happens when you think about a frontline, um, let's say, somebody who's a server who has aspirations to become a restaurant manager and then maybe even um, a chef one day? Like, what, what does that process look like? It's a lot of give and take. Um, it's a pretty good title for a book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who invited you? <laughs> Your agent. <laughs> you know, it's, I'm, as you asked the question, I'm, I was thinking about an exchange I had just last night with a prospective employee. And it, it actually led to one of my other favorite questions. My wife does not like this question. She said, she always thinks I'm bringing business speak into our marriage. And I said, no, it really, I really care. That's why I'm asking this question. But this is uh, somebody who we actually do hope to hire. And there was, a, um, there was a kind of a glitch where this person was getting advice from someone that maybe they couldn't, they couldn't sign up quite as quickly a as possible. And it didn't make sense to me. But I said, J I'm sure there's got to be a really good reason that, that you're getting that advice from somebody. Um, and I just want you to help me understand what it is. And I said, I may or may not agree with it, but if you can help me understand... That would be really helpful. Um, that's the question that sometimes doesn't work as well in my marriage. Help me understand why you're so angry with me right now. Um, <laughs> and, and what's the reaction? You're beyond help. <laughs> yeah, the, the other one that doesn't work so well in my marriage, but it really works in work, is um, it would be really nice if you had a charitable assumption about my motivations. <laughs> I've crashed and burned on that one many times. But, but anyway, what, getting back to my conversation last night with this prospective employee, I, I said, help me understand. And I said, I'm going to express why I don't think you have a problem, why I think you can actually sign up immediately. But go take that to the person giving your advice. And here's the cool thing. When you come back, I'm, I'm going to accept whatever you come back with. So if you come back, and now that you've helped me understand what you think the, the reason might be, I'm going to trust that. And it, it's going to work out. I'm going to trust whatever it is. Um, and the person wrote me a note last night saying, it's all good. I'm signing up. But here's the cool thing. He then said, thank you for trusting me to go find out on my own. And so it gave me a chance to start our relationship right now. It wasn't a make or break thing if the person doesn't sign up till next week. I really. It's not going to go 
But there were people on our team saying, the person better sign up right now or we're not going to be able to hire them. I said, uh-uh, that's not, that's not how it works. I just think that when you lead with trust, you get trust. One of the things you do in that spirit that surprised me the most is your 5149 concept. And I initially thought about this as a hiring factor, but it's much bigger than that for you. It's part of how you train people. It's part of how you develop them. Uh, so maybe as a little bit of background, I think we first connected around the idea that we both want to, to hire and promote people who are givers, not takers. And for me, what that meant in your world is you've got to be customer focused. And you said, uh-uh. Tell me more. You got to be customer focused, but the input to that is being employee focused. And really what, what I learned, again, it, it's now very, very intentional, but it was intuitive, is I want to get 100 on my test, which almost never happened for me when I was in school, but it starts with a goal. And the way that I'm going to get to 100, if I ever get there, the most points I can get for doing everything I'm supposed to do properly is 49. That's a failing grade. I need the other 51 points. The other 51 points are going to be how did I make people feel while I was trying to achieve all that technical success. So we came up with a recipe that we want 100% employees. 49% is going to be their technical skills. 51% is going to be their hospitality skills. And then furthermore, what we, what we then did was to tell everyone on the team, your job when you come to work is first and foremost to take great care of each other. To set an example of excellence with the 49% and set an example of hospitality with 51%. And you will be held accountable even before how you treat our customers, our paying customers, for how you treat each other. And the reason is that I firmly believe in vicious cycles and virtuous cycles. I, I believe that one bad thing can keep leading to something even worse, and I believe that one good thing can keep leading to something even better. So we then held everyone on our team accountable for what we call the virtuous cycle of enlightened hospitality, and their job is to put their customers second, put their colleagues first, put the community in which we do business third, put our suppliers fourth, and put our investors fifth. And I had to be crystal clear because I wasn't for the first couple of years. People thought this was a totem pole where, oh, all, I did what I was supposed to do. I took care of each other. And we didn't make any money because the employees are at the bottom of the, excuse me, the, the investors are at the bottom of the totem pole. And I realized I had not done an effective job of making it clear that this is not a totem pole. It is a prioritization of our stakeholders but it's a virtuous cycle. If you break it anywhere, you break the whole thing. And the reason that we put investors fifth is not because we want to make less money. It's because we want to make more money. Because if one good thing keeps leading to something even better, that has to be the output. But the input has to be our people. Because I, I will tell you time and time again, while we can fake it, if our team is not feeling jazzed coming to work, and feeling motivated by being surrounded by people with whom they have lots and lots of respect and trust, um, you will taste that. It will, your food will not taste as good. The hospitality will not be as good. So this is, this is the thing that, that I think works the best for us. And um, you then, you know, as I don't know if it was Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger, one of those guys said, you get the investors you deserve. But we have to be really, really crystal clear with our investors as well where they are in the pecking order and not at the bottom, but fifth. And by the way, why do I know this works? What's the best way to make happy employees? They get raises and they get promotions. Does that happen when you're not making money? Uh-uh. So it, it is truly a virtuous cycle. And when you break it anywhere, you do break the whole thing. There are organizational psychologists like Ben Schneider who would be just thrilled to see this, having for years studied the way that how you treat your employees spills over then to affect the customer experience. And it's still remarkable, though, how many leaders fail to understand this. I look at Jeff Bezos, for example, just in the last few years, finally saying we were wrong when our mission was to be, um, to be customer focused and that we wanted to be Earth's most customer centric company. We should have said we also want to be Earth's best employer. Why are so many leaders so slow to that realization? They want to make it easier for the rest of us. 
No, seriously, it's it's it doesn't cost any more money to do this. As a matter of fact, it makes it so much more gratifying to be at work. It really does. And you know, um, we were talking a little bit earlier after the great session on the four day work week. Um, and one of the questions that Adam was asking me was, do we have a four day work week and how do we feel about it? And the fact is that the pandemic kind of did a lot of this for us. First of all, I do need to, to mention that 90% of our employees uh, don't really have a choice. They cannot work remotely. I guess they, they can have a four-day work week, but they cannot work on, you can't do dishes on Zoom or decant a, <laughs> bottle, of, decant a bottle of wine for a guest on Zoom or something like that. But um, the people in our home office, and there's probably 120 uh, at Union Square Hospitality Group, do have a choice. And, you know, I got two strikes on me. It was... Uh, the end of 2020, and we were going to come back to the office full time um, after Labor Day that year. And then we got the Delta variant. And so I said, time out, we're not going to do that. And then we're going to come back full time um, on January 1st, January 3rd. I was going to give them a couple of days. And, and then we got, what was it called? It was Om Omicron. Omicron, yeah. yeah. And, now I got strike two on me. And at that point, I just said, I'm going to stop laying edicts. And I'm just going to try to make it great to come to work. Like, let people, yes, you're responsible for what your job output is to be. But make it great to come to work. And I started doing something myself, which is that every Tuesday, I would come into the office and I would just have an open hour at my desk with my door wide open. It was called Crullers with Danny. We brought in, that was the inducement, Crullers from Daily Provisions. Or crullers and Coffee is what it was called. And you could come in and talk about anything you wanted to talk about. And it was a great opportunity not only to give people a reason to want to come to work, but they wanted to be heard. Gave me a chance to hear all kinds of stuff going on. Never an agenda. There was never... You know, sometimes we didn't even talk about business. Sometimes we just talked about life. But you started to see that it became cool to, to want to come to work. We still don't have a rule. We don't have, you must be in the office three days a week. You must be in the office four days a week. But teams, turns out, like to work with teams. Turns out that for the same reason that we don't want all of our meals delivered you know, by DoorDash, we actually like going to restaurants still because people like being with people. And they get sick of being pent up in their, their own apartment by themselves. So I think it's time for lightning round and also some additional audience questions. Are you ready? Okay, first question, what is your go-to Shake Shack order? <laughs> uh, double cheeseburger with a slice of raw onion and a pickle. And I don't like raw onions, but when you get a double, the, the slice melts, and so it's cooked. That's really good. Um, order of fries. Right now we have it with Korean spice. Go for that. And I get a mini vanilla milkshake to go with it because you dip the fries in a vanilla milkshake. <laughs> Otherworldly. What's the menu item you've been dreaming about but never introduced? Where? At any restaurant? At any restaurant. I've tried so hard to have a um, barbecued bologna sandwich <laughs> topped with coleslaw and barbecue sauce. Mm -hmm. I'm so <laughs> glad that hasn't happened. Well, no, but, but think about it. Think about it for a minute. Bologna is basically um, a round hot dog. It's the exact same product, and so if you if you if you smoke it and then slice it, and then grill it, and top it with all that stuff. It fits on a hamburger bun way better than a hot dog does. It's perfect. Why, why do people love hot dogs, but they don't want this? All right. I, I think you, you just made four people think again. Well done. <laughs> uh, another, another good plug for your book there. OK. Uh, who, who's, your, who, who's your biggest leadership role model, dead or alive? You. That's 
Stop. No, it's true. You want well, to I'm not even a leader, so you, how about someone who actually like has... Would you see my podcast lineup? Come on, I listen How about someone who actually leads? Um... You can pass if I'm you passing. need to. Okay. I'm passing. Um, who, uh, what's an, an organizational culture you've been impre impressed by from afar? I would say um, J.P. Morgan. I think, I think that for a company that has that many employees, that many divisions, does business in that many cultures and countries of the world, it's remarkable how all those oars seem to be rowing in the same direction. It says a lot. What's your, uh, your favorite conversation to have with an employee who wants to grow? Help me understand what your aspirations are and what we can do to get out of your way so you can achieve them. Get out of your way as opposed to support. That's fascinating. I think that we do, it's kind of like being a parent. I think we do a much better job of screwing up our kids than helping them be successful. <laughs> um, I, I hope my kids don't hear that quote. Um, no, I, I really think that, you know, if you, if you did a great job of hiring, and that's really where we put our focus, we really focus hard on, on the hiring, then it is our job to, if you hire great people, get out of their way and let them succeed. Yes, give them the tools, but don't do stupid things that make it harder to succeed. We, we create so much friction with meetings that didn't have to happen, not providing tools that there should be, not fixing things that should have been fixed. Well, I, I think that tracks with, um, with the, all the work in psychology on how bad is stronger than good, or what our own Paul Rosen has called negativity bias. Um, and it does turn out that getting rid of things people dislike is probably a bigger positive than adding things that they love. Um, okay, last, last lightning question. Uh, you gave, last time you were here, you gave some fantastic advice for people who are afraid of taking risks. And it was an alternative to the question, what could go wrong? Enlighten us, please. Well, it, I hadn't thought about it, actually, until you asked me the question. So I, I appreciate, because now you're reinforcing it. But I think it's just a really good thing to look at opportunities. I, I'm an idea minute kind of guy. Some of them are bad, like the barbecue bologna, but, <laughs> but, but I don't like when someone comes to a meeting telling you what, what's wrong with it. So I've really grown very, very fond of asking the question, what could possibly go right? What could possibly go right? What if this thing works? And I've learned that in my own business, it helps me to dream bigger dreams when I ask that question, but it also helps us plan for success because a lot of our failures are when we got so caught up in the what could go wrong stuff that we failed to see, guys, what if this thing actually works? Will we be prepared for success? A couple other things I want to tee up uh, before we wrap. One is uh, frontline worker retention has been a huge challenge. Um, what have you done since COVID started to help with that? Single biggest thing we did um, and this was an idea that a lot of people on my team shot down. It's going to put us out of business. It's never going to work. And I stuck to my guns on it. It gets back to the 49.51%, right? Um, yes, I want 100% employee. But, but to reinforce how powerful the 51% hospitality skills are, we started giving everyone on our team a 51% discount to dine at any of our places anytime. And I will tell you that... Uh, it is better than any health insurance, any family leave policy. It's, it has been the most potent retention tool ever. And wow. the better part of it is that, you know, a lot of people who work in our industry cannot necessarily afford to eat at a lot of the kind of restaurants. Uh, and our guests are bringing in all these expectations but our own staff hasn't had the experience themselves. So by giving this 51% discount, it allows our staff members to actually understand the experience they're providing. How does it feel to be on the receiving end? But here's the even best part of it, is that they end up telling us what we need to do to get better, which is so much better than me telling them what they need to do to get better. 
Yes, that resonates. So you're saying to everyone in this room who has a retention challenge, it's just two steps to solve it. Number one, start a food business. <laughs> and then number two, discount for employees. OK, check. I would think 51% off anyone's business would be a help, helpful thing. Only, only if your employees like your products or services. Well, Open question. All right, uh, next question. Uh, th this is a, a great audience question. You mentioned earlier treating each other well is a, a key expectation. How do you measure that? Um, trust surveys. We do pulse surveys. You know, we have guest sentiment. We have employee sentiment. And we know on a pretty ongoing basis how we're doing in both. And at the end of the day, I kind of feel like there's three things. If they're all headed in the right direction, I'm sleeping really well at night. Does it feel better to work here today than it did last time we asked? Does it feel better to dine here today? And are we making more money? If those three things are check marks. If any one of those is not, it's generally connected to the other two. Another question I loved here is, how do you navigate subcultures across different locations? You want to allow for variation, obviously, yeah. but you want some consistency, too. Well, how do you walk that tightrope? We rope? champion it. So as long as the, the really core things, like what I call enlightened hospitality, and you know, excelling at the expected behaviors. And I do believe that the businesses that outbehave the competition um, are the ones that prevail. If we used to say outperform. I really think it's outbehave. But um, we actually, we have something we call sibling revelry. We have a lot of different restaurants. Um, as long, I, and I love the fact that, that each one has its own, we call house pride. As long as, as long as we're really good at establishing organization pride, I love the fact that there's a sibling revelry between the restaurants with the house pride. And we actually create opportunities for them to compete with each other. Sometimes on the playing field at staff you know, picnics. Sometimes and we do, we do um, annually an award ceremony where we reinforce the behaviors that we want. But all the restaurants kind of sit with themselves, and they're rooting for their own team. And it's pretty cool watching that. As a follow-up on that, there's obviously a behavioral scientist in the room who wants to know, do you run experiments between your different locations? No. Sorry. Next year. OK. Uh, I'd like to know what kind I might run. I think, um, I think we have, we have, we've already sketched out a few here. Uh, I like this. Uh, I, did, I, I do have to say one other thing we did once, which was great. After a particularly tough winter, and this was a few years ago, really cold, cold winter in New York. Um, the economy wasn't doing great. I had a cold one day, and I went to one of our restaurants, and I said, I just need a really good bowl of chicken soup. And that chef made me an amazing bowl. It was the chef of Tabla. Um, and uh, just, it was great. Chili peppers, ginger, all the stuff made me feel better. And I said, you know what? What this town could use right now is a good bowl of chicken soup. And I challenged every one of our chefs to do an experiment. So maybe I did do this, where each chef could put his or her thumbprint on chicken soup. And each one. Wait, how is that sanitary? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go on. That was good. That you meant it metaphorically. I did, I did. Um, <laughs> but that was adorable. Um, <laughs> anyway, anyway, they all came up with their own recipe, and we promoted this thing. We gave all the recipes out, and we said to our guests, for every bowl of chicken soup we sell for this month, we're going to give $3 to City Harvest to fight hunger. You get to feel better. We get to promote what is different about each one of our restaurants. That was a pretty cool thing. Well, Danny, you talk a lot about enlightened hospitality. I have to say, what I admire you most for is enlightened leadership. I think the way that you operate in the world is exactly how I want every leader to be. Uh, and I know you would be the first to say, I don't want to be cloned. But I think the world could use a few more Danny Myers. <laughs> And I think, you know, it just... lost all of his credibility with that last statement right there. <laughs> Completely disagree. There's a great expression in, in Italian, basta così. <laughs> Enough already. 
Well, if, if, I, can, if I can you. just embarrass you for a second, I will say in, the, in all the time we've known each other, I've never seen you say no to any request, ever. And although I worry about your well-being, um, I greatly appreciate the, the way that you're willing to serve and, and share your wisdom. And I know we've all benefited from that today. So thank you. Thank you.